trenchant thinker, as a matter of fact. I want to welcome you both and appreciate your giving up your time to answer some questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Carrie, for having me. Now, let's jump right into it. Lauren, you want to be on city council. There's obviously a great reason why. Yes, well, you know, we, um, as you said, we've had uh, the same city leaders for a long time. And if you really want change in the city, then you're going to have to change the uh, the, the people that are on council. Uh, we have we have different issues happening. We have parking issues. We have traffic issues. We have housing affordability issues. And I I'm running to to help make things better. And better is the operative word because it goes way just beyond parking. And John D'Amico, uh, you've been in the city government. And, you know, of the greater population, what would you say the, the top three points are that you guys endlessly have to deal with? Well, I think in this election uh, and in the past uh, four years since I was elected, the, the, since I was elected, um, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, ethics and transparency and about development and what's actually sustainable for us as a community. And then, as uh, Lauren mentioned, about uh, affordability and uh, who's in and who's out and um, how we protect our current residents and how we invite in uh, new folks who are moving into our newly, co newly completed uh, buildings. And we have, you know, let's just call them uh, for lack of exactitude, or for, for actually to honor exactitude, we also have weird controversies. If the L.A. Times is to be believed, if the uh, L.A. Weekly is to be believed, these are mainstream media, including local blogs, local newspapers, there is a kind of uh, curious uh, sexual peccadillo going on in the current sitting parts of it anyway. City council, uh, people giving sex partners, city jobs, things like that. What would both of you say about uh, what ought to be done for that kind of behavior from your own personal ethics? Let me begin by saying I can't comment on what's happening in the city because there's obviously investigations and uh, it's HR matters. <laughs> Um, and I just think that's the right thing to say. Um, and so I, I, I really don't want to comment on that, Carrie, but perhaps Lauren has some, some ideas or thoughts that might reflect what the community is thinking. Yeah, well, I think, I think there's actually a bigger picture, and that City Hall is dysfunctional and overly political. And, uh, and, and that, again, comes from people being there for a long period of time. And being there for a long period of time does create a long series of issues that people now have to deal with. And Lauren, you're a woman. The role of women in politics, uh, seeing as if we go back to one of my favorite stories in history, the Iroquois population, going back to Native Americans, when Ben Franklin and others observed the curious thing, which much of our federal government is wrapped around, and there were one-third of the Iroquois Council were women. The reason was that instead of the male uh, imperative, which is kill it, then find out why it was upset, if you ran it through the women, they would say, well, what's, what's, what do they want to know? What, what are they, what's their issue? And um, I think this may also be an interesting solution, de seeing as we've got developers and a lot of sort of testosterone-driven, aggressive uh, business acumen that has uh, hair and teeth, and gnashing hair and teeth, at least that's the opinion of many people who live here. Um, would you offer that maybe stand back and look at it female approach? Well, you know, I don't know if it's really... For me, gender-driven, I mean, uh, four years ago, I voted for John D'Amico because I thought he was the most qualified candidate uh, versus a, a female candidate that was running. Uh, from, I would like people to vote for me because I'm the best candidate. Um, I, do, I don't think that West Hollywood has any shortage of strong, smart women. If you look at uh, uh, most of the neighborhood activists in our city, they're women. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I, I think it's really a little bit about timing, um, and I do believe that you know we've had some, uh, you know, the old boys' club mentality on council, but um, 
you know, I think that uh, I think that women have a have a good shot at this, but you have to be the right candidate. Here's a test. And, it, and it's been meant. Go ahead, Jim. I was going to say it's been my experience that um, <clears throat> many of the developers who have been um, fairly clear with me uh, that they're nervous about a strong-voiced woman on our city council. So, in fact, um, you know, there's an awful lot of uh, money been raised to make sure that uh, someone like Lauren does not end up on our city council. Uh, meanwhile, the men on our city council, um, you know, we can barely keep shut. We talk about everything and we have opinions about everything. And uh, so it's not clear to me uh, that it's gender uh, related from the residential point of view so much as it is from the developer point of view that they're just very nervous about uh, someone like Lauren who is very, very smart and, and uh, strong-willed and has very... Um, from my point of view, uh, appropriate ideas about the next 30 years of our city or certainly the next uh, pivot of our city in terms of development. And, you know, they're just not used to that. Our our, our long history with development for 30 years, uh, going back to the very beginning, is that, um, you know, we said, please like us. Whatever you want to do, just like us, and we will approve it. And I think that I've been working for the last four years to slow that down and bring that to an end because it isn't sustainable. There's Currently, there's a, about $1.5 billion worth of construction in our 1.9 square mile city with a billion dollars in the pipeline. And that is just not a sustainable model for uh, any kind of uh, capacity building or thinking about how we would want to treat our residents or our businesses or our traffic or our parking, et cetera. And most importantly, almost, our environment. Uh, we don't really have a very good green building standard. It's, uh, it was designed in the 90s, and it certainly shows. Um, our buildings get, you get points for things that are um, technology of a decade ago instead of uh, forcing or asking or um, setting a standard for actual green building development that would not harm our environment not harm our environment and make our city that much better. So I think there are lots of things wrapped up in this question of women on the council. And from my point of view, the strongest voices belong on that council because we have, we are facing some actual crises in terms of the way in which our city uh, needs to pivot and move forward. Very much so. Uh, to that point, as we talk right now live with John D'Amico and Lauren Meister, both of whom want to be in West Hollywood City Council, both of whom offer a unique and uh, improved vision. At least that is the opinion of many, many, which is why we're offering them a voice here. We're also taking your live tweets right now. Hashtag Go Harrison. Hashtag Go Harrison. Have a bunch of them piling up. You can also send live text messages through a phone. 310-737-TALK. 310-737-TALK. Here's a text that just came in for either John or Lauren, and it speaks to the development that you just uh, so smartly brought up there, John, because that is a big issue for people. The text reads, quote, Would you support a moratorium on development of mega projects that are snarling the traffic and putting stress on the infrastructure? Um, I can take that. Uh, early start. Uh, I, you know, I don't know if it's a, a matter of a moratorium. I think it's really just looking, you know, when when a, a project goes before, uh, you know, files an application and it goes before planning commission and city council, an environmental impact report study, uh, study is done. And we need to look at those studies and actually uh, look at the analysis and decide if it's the right project or not. Uh, I think that both John and I would agree that, you know, by right development is is something we should encourage. Is the problem is the bonuses and the incentives that take, a, say, a project that's 45 feet uh, in a zone that's 45 feet, and then it all of a sudden becomes 100 feet tall, and that's and that's where the problem lies. So it's really about, uh, you know, keep keeping to the zoning. And, and I would say that uh, this is something I've been trying to do for the four years I've been on council and hope that um, with 
Lauren's help and if our colleague, uh, future colleague, Jim Gardarama, gets elected with Joe's help, is uh, if we do go to this extraordinary measure of changing the zoning code and changing the general plan, then that developer needs to build that building or they need to give up their entitlement. But all too often, almost nine times out of ten, we give away these big bonuses to developers and then they turn around and they sell them and they make millions of dollars on the backs of our residents and then the new owner comes to us and says i can't possibly build this the way that uh, the previous owner boxed me into a corner so i need to have all these additional ways to uh, make this project work and uh you know we're in some ways maybe not stuck, but uh, we're left with uh, a not very good set of choices. And so right. from my point of view, I think if if we looked at what we're giving away and we were very clear to the people we're giving it away to, which is to say if we're going to this extraordinary measure for a new hotel or a um, – uh, a new residential complex, even if it comes with a community benefit, you have to build this within two years or your entitlement expires, and we'll just see what comes next because um, we have seen properties that have 20-year-long entitlements, and they've changed hands two and three times, and that's just no way for us to be doing business anymore. I think that that uh, please like us really has to turn in turn into let's do this together so that we can make promises to our residents about what we're doing and we can get promises from these developers that they have an actual building in mind not just some uh, way for them to uh, make some money Harrison, right, and, we are talking right now, by the way, with uh, Lauren Meister and John D'Amico. They are running for West Hollywood City Council. We're talking about some of the greater issues that people are dealing with, things that have frustrated the general public for a while. Both of these people uniquely have stepped out and are admitting that they see these things too. We're not all crazy here that these problems actually are occurring, and they've come up with some creative solutions around them, uh, many of which do not include or disinclude the very behaviors that have become objectionable to so many of us. Uh, I think both of you acknowledge that uh, being in government service is actually being an employee of the very public who placed you there, a key thing. We call that crazy when the Tea Party says it, but when sane people say it, it seems like a reasonable statement, right? Uh, it's reasonable to me, and um, uh, I'm, you know, I, I think... Um, I actually do work for a bureaucracy. I work at UCLA. I go to work every day. I have a boss. My boss has a boss. Uh, she has a boss. You know, so we all uh, we all understand here at my day job that um, you know people rely on us to do our jobs in the right way. When you're an elected official and you are a part-time elected official, it's easy to forget that. Um, the residents are really the people who are relying on us to do what's in their best interest all the time, every time. And uh, often that means that we have to say no to people. And um, I know from serving for now four years that some of my colleagues weren't very comfortable saying no to people. And I think we need to uh, we need to perhaps not uh, stop development, but we need to make sure that our development makes more sense now. We need to be progressive together and not stop progress. Let's jump right, into that for just a second, Lauren, and, and, and I'd love your thoughts on this too. This just saying yes to everybody and wanting to be liked, not everyone understands what is the upside for the public to that? What is the upside for anybody to be a people pleaser when there's so much at stake? Let, let's understand the thinking behind that behavior so that we can understand how you guys would be different. Well, you know, I don't, I don't know that the residents have really been listened to the last few years. I mean, we went through a general plan process, and, and John can tell you as well that that residents were saying we don't want uh, areas to be upzoned. Um, we don't want all these incentives and bonuses. Uh, but the council majority, uh, you know, although John tried to change it, but he's one voice, and the council majority basically, uh, you know, didn't listen. And um, that really, that's really what needs to start happening is we need to start putting our residents first. 
And I would I would say that that Lauren's right. I mean, one one of the major things that I did manage to change in the general plan was to reduce bonuses that were uh, along. Uh, in areas that did not have um, major intersections. And I think that will have some effect in the long term. But this this other idea um, that really is, I think, a hangover from the 1980s uh, is that um, we should just say yes because we don't know if we'll ever be asked again. And I think that it's pretty clear that for the foreseeable future, I mean, we never know there could be a devastating earthquake when we all finish this radio show and, and all bets are off. But for the foreseeable future, West Hollywood is a place that has uh, intense um, development pressures. And, um, and our job, I think, is really about saying, you know what, we need to curate – what happens in our city, because the very thing that makes us interesting is very easy to obliterate. I mean, how many of us know of our favorite uh, vacation spot that was really quaint and fantastic, and you went back 10 years later, and it was a completely different place? And, you know, I'm not suggesting that West Hollywood is uh, only a vacation spot, but those of us that understand it as a an urban village and understand it as a place that's walkable and enjoyable and safe, um, we think that's worth protecting. And, yes, there are plenty of mega corporations and investment firms that are willing to put down three, four, five hundred million dollars uh, to get a piece of what West Hollywood is which is, uh, you know, a sort of cultural center. It's it's uh, part of the, the culture-making industry. And, um, and I understand why someone would want to invest here, but if it's not in our best interest, I think we just need to say this just isn't in our best interest. I mean, imagine a TGI Fridays on Sunset Strip. You know, that's a, that's a sort of horrible idea. But you know, yes, it is. Given our given our given our history and our sort of idea about what we're doing, yeah. it's not that far off. I mean, in the in one year, four banks opened up on the Sunset Strip, mm. and we finally had to put a moratorium on banks on the Sunset Strip because we were thinking, you know, if these are businesses that aren't open at night, then it's not doing us any good. Because mm. that's what this has to be: is a street that's uh, based on its nighttime business. Right, and right. Right. I was just going to say we have to remember the character of our, of our different neighborhoods, and the Sunset Strip is where we have our, our nightlife. And, uh, you know, Santa Monica Boulevard is where we have our, our boys' town, and Melrose is where we have our art and design. So let's make sure we have appropriate uh, business there. So exactly you, right. You and, mentioned, you and both, it's got to be you it, both mentioned it, it, one more thing, and it, I'm just going to jump in for a second. You both mentioned sure. earlier about uh, uh, hungry businesses and all of that. Not everyone lives in the world of this conversation. All they know is everything keeps changing, high rises everywhere, um, you know, modern three forty million dollar parking structures behind City Hall for whom? Well, something else must be coming, but nobody gets to talk about it. Um, so there's a lot of invisible stuff going on in back rooms, it seems. At least people's sense is that. Secret stuff going on with the government that ends up changing the face of the city they live in. Is any of this reversible, or can we modify it, or what, what do we do here? Well, I would, I would argue that um, it seems uh, more intense because it is more intense. There has been um, this in, intense pressure uh, on the community development department and on the city itself to um, to accept or at least to look at um, all of this development that shows up uh, on the second floor and plunks itself down on the desk and begins what is often for many developers a two-year process. But... Um, you know that uh, that's an actual fact. People people um, 
Well, there's one other thing. What used to be um, local businesses then turned into national businesses, then turned into sort of uh, conglomerate investment groups, and now has turned into mostly family dollars, and the billions of dollars are gathering up properties and uh, planning developments. And so in some way, there's less transparency even from where the money is coming from. You know, what used to be um, a property owner that we all knew would come to City Hall and there would be a discussion with them about what's happening and they would talk to their neighbors, is now uh, family money, and it's a brother talking to an uncle over a table in Beverly Hills, and nobody gets to know what their actual plan is. And um, as we've seen on Beverly, you know, those plans change sometimes every 24 hours, depending on, you know, which way the wind is blowing and how they think they can squeeze it through. So I, I don't think people are that far off track The development pressures are really intense. What we need to do as a city, once we finish this election, and then in June, at least from my point of view, is we need to have a discussion about, you know, how do we better reflect what the residents would like us to do, while keeping this idea that as a cultural capital and as a business center and and an entertainment district, that's what's going to keep uh, the city functioning in terms of its budget. But I think Lauren has really hit the nail on the head. We just stop listening closely enough. We hear people say, oh, we don't like the traffic. Well, yeah, and we need to do something about it. Just listening is not enough. We need to take action and do something about these problems. Let's jump into that, Lauren. Uh, everybody, 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 ubiquitously, 24-7, nobody is left out deals with traffic on Santa Monica Boulevard. Uh, I live on an intersection in Marilyn Monroe's former apartment, by the way, where we happen to be right now, at least our side of the coin, which is on the intersection of Norton and um, uh, Crescent Heights, where, you know, if you breathe in the wrong direction, a car is going to come by and clip your breath. It's it's very prickly business. And we all worry about it and something as simple as a footbridge over santa monica boulevard would certainly mitigate it allow traffic to move in all directions but everything seems endlessly impossible but it can't be impossible can it well you know traffic is is uh is it the big is one of the biggest issues as i've gone from the west side to the east side of west hollywood and there are things that we can be doing you know locally to try to alleviate some of that traffic. We could be expanding our city line. We could be expanding our uh, our pickup trolley. Uh, we can be working with the city of L.A. to bring back the dash, which uh, which was on La Cienega, and, and unfortunately we, we lost when the city of L.A. was having budget problems. I mean, obviously we should be advocating for, for Metro, but that's going to take – you know, that's going to take many years. So we need to be doing things here. We need to uh, coordinate with the city of L.A., our traffic lights with signal Uh So we're synchronizing our traffic lights. We need to do something with our crosswalks so that they're safer, but keeps the traffic flowing. And, and what I have been advocating for are uh, mid, mid-block uh, traffic lights that are synchronized with the rest of our traffic lights for, Wait a minute. for the process. Synchronizing the traffic lights. <laughs> I know. It, what a concept. <laughs> it's, it's actually helped the city of L.A. reduce trip times 10 to 15 percent. Yeah, yeah. And, and the curious banners, former billboard next to City Hall of winking before you walk. Let me just understand this. A city asking its residents to strip down topless and wink at motorists somehow helps traffic. If that is indeed such a good idea, is that simultaneously being recommended to New York City, to Miami, to Chicago and Zurich, Switzerland, as the ultimate traffic unclogger, stripping down and winking at motorists? <laughs> I, I think the uh, I think you're you're mixing your traffic problems. Uh, that uh, tongue-in-cheek. Um, Uh, ad campaign was about crossing safely and uh, encouraging people to make eye contact with the driver before they stepped out in front of the car. Half-naked people. 
Yeah, uh, naked or not, it's best to make eye contact uh, with the driver. And that did, I believe, come out at the end of the summer and the hot days of uh, late September and early October. So it had some it had some play at that time as well. But I think uh, Lauren hits on an important thing about traffic, which is that we also have uh, many developments that we have approved that came with mitigation measures um, that should be put in place when those developments are finished. These are traffic mitigation measures. And I, I would argue and have asked, um, but again, don't have the votes to get it accomplished, that we would put those mitigation measures in place now. Uh, why wait for them to build the development? And uh, from my point of view, the worst thing that can happen is the traffic problem will get better. Uh, because, you know, putting an extra lane or a right turn lane or a left arrow signal, those kinds of things do make a difference. And, uh, yes, they are supposed to be paid for by the developer uh, when the project is uh, finishing construction. But uh, we can all we can all think of a place where we wish it was uh, somehow managed a little better. Um, and uh, all of those already exist, and we would just need to put them in place. Now, in asking my colleagues on the council, from the past 30 years, uh, you know, they're not interested in doing that, which is another reason why I have, you know, fairly uh, clearly and uh, vocally uh, tried to make it clear that these ideas from the past and their hard work does, uh, does not necessarily go unnoticed, but um, unless we actually turn the page and we actually think about today going forward and the future we want to have, we'll be stuck with these problems that for whatever reason, the narrative has been they're unsolvable. Well, they're not unsolvable. Uh, we might not be able to return traffic to 35 miles an hour on every road in West Hollywood, but I do believe we can have actual impacts very quickly if we would just uh, focus on it and spend some of our money on it. Right. And, and Carrie, from a planning perspective, if we would uh, encourage more neighborhood businesses uh, if we would work to protect our current, our existing neighborhood businesses, that's how you know people walk. If you want to keep the walkability of a city, you need to have neighborhoods serving businesses. Otherwise, those people are going to get in their cars to go somewhere else to, you know, pick up their dry cleaning or go to the shoemaker. Um, and the way the development has has been going the last few years, we have developers that you know come in. And these big developments happen, and then it's too expensive for those neighborhood businesses to come back. That um, is, that, you know, that's a great point, a really great point, because it also speaks to one of the issues near and dear to the establishment of the city to begin with is a livable city. Apart from being a walkable city, which is my favorite, favorite, favorite part, is I've got a Whole Foods, a Trader Joe's, a gym, movie theaters. The whole soup cat pizza is all within five minutes. It's, it's an extraordinary setup, and to preserve that is is so brilliant. Um, there are people of age. Uh, we're all ripening, whether we like it or not, and, and are concerned, gosh, can we still afford somehow to stay in this city that we like to walk in, that we like to have lunch on the sidewalk in? Well, I would I would say that uh, your your I believe your sort of um, uh, bringing up or um, nodding towards our rent controlled housing, which is our biggest asset, and we should do everything we can to protect our rent controlled housing. And in fact, if there were a moratorium on any kind of uh, building, uh, that would be one that I would support, which is that we not demolish a single rent controlled unit until we have a plan for the people who live in them. Because what used to be when I moved to West Hollywood in the early 80s, uh, then left to go to graduate school, came back in the early 90s, you could rent an apartment and then move three blocks away and rent another apartment and move three blocks away and rent another apartment a few years later. And now if you lose, you lose your apartment in West Hollywood, you're basically kicked out of town because uh, all apartments that are rent controlled uh, set to market rates. And so there's just no possible way for someone who's living in an apartment they've lived in for six or eight or a dozen or 22 years uh, to find another apartment in the city. And that, to me, is not acceptable. Um, when we have 
actual housing stock that if we invested some money in, we could fix up our rent-controlled housing and give it another 30 or 40 years of of existence. And, you know, sadly, John Hyam and Abbey Land have done all they could to confuse the story about affordable housing and rent control. Now, everyone is for both. I want us to build as much affordable housing as we can. And, of course, we're going to have rent control. But I think we need to invest some of those millions of dollars that we put into our uh, our city every year into extending the life of our rent-controlled housing. Because if you owned a 10 unit building in the city, you probably inherited it from your parents. And it's now worth a couple million dollars. And maybe you have a half a million dollar loan on it, so you could sell it and walk away with a million and a half dollars. Or wait 10 or 12 years to get that million and a half dollars in rent or longer. And so if you sell it, the new owner tears it down. And those 10 units, those 10 residents are thrown out of town and you build 10 more units because our our zoning code says you have to build 90 percent of the allowable units and you get 10 units plus two bonus affordable units and now there's 12 units but those 10 residents can't fit into two units and those 10 new apartments cost three or four times as much so we don't really know what happens to those residents that get kicked out of town. Their collateral damage in this real estate merry-go-round in which um, what we've done is we haven't really made it any better for the city, but we have taken 10, 10 residents and thrown them out of town, created two affordable units for two families or people who didn't already live in West Hollywood, and then there's 10 new people who live in West Hollywood who are perfectly nice people, but in my mind, we need to understand what's going to happen to our rent-controlled housing. And right now, we don't have a plan. Lauren? Yeah, uh, well, what I was going to say is that, especially with with development, and, and, and our city has had a history now of giving, giving out development agreements uh, to these developers um, in order to build bigger uh, projects, we should be getting a, a very large benefit for that. And to me, a benefit would be that that for a housing project, for example, that the developer sets aside additional units that are uh, outside of the inclusionary housing that are under a covenant where uh, like a rent control covenant, because you can do that with a development agreement, even though, you know, we have a state law, if it's a private agreement between the city and the developer, there's no reason why we can't uh, you know why we can't have that. Um, so you know if we're gonna if we're gonna build something outside what's allowed by the zoning code, then then we we should be getting something great out of it. And the same thing with uh, you know with with commercial developments and parking. Why why are we you know getting bonuses and incentives and less parking spaces when what we need is we need more parking spaces. Um, and uh, you know so if to build outside the zoning, then, then they really need to be providing something uh, that the city needs and that the community supports. And we need broad community support for those kinds of projects. I have Gary, a... I want to give you a couple, yeah, go ahead, couple more facts about, about our residents. So um, a lot of people don't know this, but uh, almost 90% of the working people in the city leave town every day to go to work. And more than 90% of our jobs in our city are uh, filled by people who don't live in West Hollywood. So right there, that's um, nearly uh, 120,000 trips, car trips, every day. People coming and going to work and, uh, and uh, to home. And then you add into that the twenty to 30,000 people who come to West Hollywood to go to the gym or have a meal or have a drink or hang out or whatever, you know, people do come to city to have fun. Uh, that's another 40,000 trips. So our city, which uh, used to have uh, a, a, a much larger number of people who lived and worked in West Hollywood, that's all changed. And that also adds to our traffic problem. So this is a longer term goal, but I think we need to figure out ways to uh, 
move people, keep people in the city who are working in the city and move people to West Hollywood or at least close to West Hollywood for jobs that are coming into our city, especially jobs at our studio lots or at IAC or at some of our higher end restaurants, because, you know, most people who work at a restaurant can't afford a $2 million house. That's just sort of the story. So, um, if we lose even more of our rent-controlled housing to people who need to make seventy, eighty, ninety, a hundred thousand dollars a year in order to afford it, that means we're going to just continue to add to our traffic problem. Yeah, and we have to stop uh, pushing this myth that every you know with these big projects like the Dillon or the Huxley that we're providing housing with those projects. We're providing very expensive, high-end housing and very few low, low affordable units. So, you know, to say, well, we're approving these projects because because there's, they're housing, 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 it's, it's not really acceptable because we're losing our workforce. As John mentioned, we're, we're, we're losing our workforce uh, housing and, and the people at middle income people, uh, they, they don't have housing here anymore. They can't afford it. So it's either you're either high, high or you're low, low, and we've become a city of haves and have nots. So here's a text coming in from 310-737-TALK as we continue to talk to Lauren Meister and to John D'Amico. They are candidates for the West Hollywood City Council, and they're offering some really excellent ideas, something that I think the general public would fully agree with. Uh, they certainly speak with the sentiment that the public has. People want to be heard. People want to feel expressed. People want to feel safe. Safe. They want to feel like their government is actually there governing for and behalf of them. This text comes in from 310-737-TALK. Also, we're taking live tweets. Hashtag Go Harrison. This one wants to know, uh, what about compliance for these developers who may have promised in the past to do things but never had their feet held to the fire? And also crummy landlords, as they put it, crummy landlords. Well, I'm not aware. I mean, certainly if someone is aware of, of a developer that was supposed to be doing something they didn't do, um, then let me know and we'll check their agreement and make sure that they do it. In terms of, of uh, crummy landlords, yes, we have a lot of them. And uh, we have a very strong um, uh, housing uh, services department, and uh, they will work with your landlord through our our, um, uh, our uh, rent stabilization commission and uh, make sure that uh, whatever it is that is supposed to be provided as part of your lease uh, is provided. But I also want to say that, uh, that we have a lot of really amazing landlords, and we have a lot of landlords who uh, are um, family-owned businesses. Something that the Chamber of Commerce will tell you is that the largest single number of businesses are rental housing owners. That's the largest single number of small businesses in the city. And, you know, we need to work with those businesses to make sure that they stay in business and don't go out of business and sell those units and uh, kick out all the residents who live in those units. Right. And John had a great idea a couple of years ago to um, try to uh, work with uh, property owners by doing, say, for historic properties, uh, some kind of grant or uh, low-cost or no-cost loans, which would benefit not only the, the property owner, but also the residents of those of those properties. And, uh, you know, he just, he didn't have the votes for it, which was really a shame. Uh, because, you know, this, this is the kind of thinking we need to have. We need to go out of the box. And this is kind of the great idea here, is going out of the box and creating or recreating maybe history, which is sort of uh, everyone's fantasy is sort of to rewind it back to a livable place. And Lauren, you're the newcomer here. John, you've already been in the city government. Lauren, you've been here for many, many years watching things change um, with the general public. You stepped forward. Finally, it said, you know, I need to get involved uh, way beyond the already uh, excellent uh, civics lesson that you taught many of us of how to suit up and show up on behalf of your fellow citizens. Now you're doing it for real. What's your, your motivation here? I think people want to know. Well, you know, I, I've been involved for over 17 years uh, and uh, trying to make change from the outside. 
uh, and there's some change that you have to do from the inside. Um, it's, it's, it's time. And I feel that, that the city needs, the residents need someone like me, a neighborhood activist, to represent them. And John, you I and Lauren that... are uh, happy bedfellows here in this uh, quest to make things better. So you must see it the same way. Well, I see it uh, in a similar way. And, um, you know, what's kind of fantastic about Lauren and I is that we disagree and we still work together. And um, and I think that's what important about uh, government that's that's so lacking. You know, I got elected in 2011 and John Heilman would not speak to me for two and a half years, refused to shake my hand. I mean, that's not the kind of partners we need on our city government. And, you know, everyone at City Hall said, oh, that's just how he is. That's just what's up. And in my mind, I kept thinking, you know, that's like what everyone says about their alcoholic father. You know, just excuse him. It's not. A, it's like, no, he's an elected official in the city of West Hollywood. He should man up and shake my hand. And it wasn't until he was embarrassed into it publicly that he was finally willing to do it. And, you know, from my point of view, what's most interesting for me about working with Lauren is that she will have a very particular point of view, and that will give our city council even more depth. It will give us even more depth when we are talking about how we act as an organization and how we think about our city as we can, you know, say, well, we have an even larger pool of points of view represented now. That's why I, you know, want Lauren to be there. That's why I want Joe Artorama to be there. His ethics ideas are so top-notch and so checked into what the city needs for us to do right now. We don't need to have another 30 years of, oh, really, that's going on? Oh, really? I didn't know that. Oh, I wasn't in charge of that. Oh, no, we need to be in charge of it. We need to know. We need to stop asking for donations from developers for our private pet charities. We need to uh, make sure that people know exactly where dollars are coming from and who's donating them and what the outcome is. And if we do that, then we can burn back some of the respect of our residents. And, you know, I, I hope we can do that. We'll see what happens on March 3rd. Are you using the magical T word of transparency? I, I am. I mean, I, I think that... Um, that that's an actual thing. And I don't talk about it uh, uh, lightly. I mean, I, um, I have been really clear that, um, that the more we know about our government, the more it will affect the behavior of our elected officials. So, you know, if you wanted to buy any song ever recorded, you could do it for 99 cents and probably have it downloaded within 30 seconds. But if you wanted to find out how much money we spent to cut the trees in our city, it's impossible to find it out. And I just think that that's not okay. You know, we should know. Why would you want to know how much we spend on cutting trees? Doesn't matter. You know, the same reason you might want to you know, buy a Doris Day song, whatever, buy it. But I think that the internet and the idea of, of uh, all information is available in both directions is really important. And that will change what we do as elected officials. And eventually this idea will reach its way to Congress and that will change what Congress does as well. Lauren, your final thoughts on that? Yeah, um, well, I, I'm all for transparency. I was actually on the campaign finance reform uh, committee with Joe Gardarama a couple of years ago. And, uh, you know, a lot of the things that we came up with, uh, you know, just were not, were not either, they were either not approved by council or they were approved and then they were undone. So, you know, look, when, when we were discussing uh, campaign reform and, and ethics. Uh, the city and county of San Francisco has a great uh, uh, ethics uh, legislation, and there's no reason why, why we have to reinvent the wheel. We could be looking at that. Um, that's, you know, that's my yes. thought. I, I think I think Lauren's exactly right. You know, there, there are really easy ways for us to take um, we don't have to take the money out of 
out of uh, elections, but we can make ourselves out of the decision making if we've taken money during elections. And, you know, that's just an interesting idea. If we had a six month uh, period with which you can't vote on something if you accepted a donation for a campaign, you know, that would change what would happen. That would change our behavior. It's if reasonable. Had... I mean, you know, we expect right. that uh, theoretically anyway of our senators, of our congressmen, of our president of the United States, allegedly anyway. Yeah. And so it's I, not unreasonable here. Yeah. I've, right. been and- disclosing, I've been disclosing my donations at every meeting before every vote. And then, you you know, John Duran started doing it. And then you look at Abby and John Heilman, and this is what they disclosed. I drove by the site. Well, this is right. a 1.9 square mile city. I would hope you have driven by the site, but they won't disclose whether they took money from the developer as a donation for their charity or they raised money for another charity or they took money uh, for their campaigns. And for me, from my point of view, that inability to speak their own truth is troubling to me. It's just right. about being honest. And the other thing that we can do, and it's in line with what John is talking about, is we can have staff reports disclose donations. You know, it, it can be as part of the staff report because because there's there are campaign finance forms that we all fill out. And yes, uh, you know, it, 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 you know, people can can go online and look at them, but that's kind of a pain. So why not have staff do it and include it as a, a in the, in the appendix of a staff report on a major development? <laughs> I like this. Is this something that you both would want to stand behind and something that we as the public might expect to be able to enjoy then? Absolutely, from my point of view. Absolutely. Why not? Well, isn't this fun and refreshing? The the heliotropic tendrils of the sun god filtering and flickering through the dew-dropped lilies of possibility. This is such a, a cool glass of water in a parched desert of blocked, um, hidden stuff. And and I think we can all get behind this. It's basic civics 101, and that you both recognize it and are willing to stand behind it really is a game changer here. Would you both like to wrap with uh, just a couple of minutes of your fantasy West Hollywood and what that might look like under your loving touch? (laughs) My fantasy West Hollywood, I, you know, Honestly, I just I, I want a city that listens to its residents, that respects its history, that as it moves forward and, and progresses, what we do still complements our history and and keeps it in mind because because we're all here because we love what West Hollywood stood for. And John? that's right. And I would I would I would uh, second what Lauren said and and add. Um, there's a couple of um, nuances that, uh, you know, this this city has uh, always been a place where people have come to invent their lives, whether it's uh, hipsters in the 50s or uh, um, the beatniks and uh, uh, hippies and uh, Russians and gay guys and rock and rollers and designers. And, um, you know, I think that's the history of our city. And. Yes, so much of our discussion in this election has been about development and overdevelopment. And um, for me, I'm looking forward to and have been trying to practice this idea in the four years that I've been on the council that the more we open up to a diverse and uh, and deep set of ideas and people and talking points, the better the city will become and we will find ourselves in another wave of sort of people who come to West Hollywood to invent the future. And that's what's most exciting to me. Yes, another nice building that produces another blah, blah, blah. That can't hurt, we hope. But I'm mostly interested in the residents and in our creative past that needs to be our creative future. Well, I'm very grateful that both of you bravely came on. I have to say, uh, a handful of the other ones, maybe a a truckload full of the other ones, were disinclined to stand transparently in front of the voting public, the people with real skin in the game. And you two showed up. You showed up for us. 
and you're going to show up again on Wednesday for the I would like people to vote for me because I'm the best candidate. Um, I do. I don't think that West Hollywood has any shortage of strong, smart women. If you look at uh, uh, most of the neighborhood activists in our city, they're women. Um, so, I, I, you know, I, I, I think it's really a little bit about timing. Um, and I do believe that, you know, we've had some, uh, you know, the old boys club mentality on council. But, um, you know, I think that uh, I think that women have a have a good shot at this. But you have to be the right candidate. Here's a test. And, it, and it's been meant. Go ahead, John. I was going to say it's been my experience that um, <clears throat> many of the developers who have been um, fairly clear with me uh, that they're nervous about a strong-voiced woman on our city council. So, in fact, um, you know, there's an awful lot of uh, money been raised to make sure that uh, someone like Lauren does not end up on our city council. Uh, meanwhile, the men on our city council, um, you know, we can barely keep shut. We talk about everything and we have opinions about everything. And uh, so it's not clear to me uh, that it's gender uh, related from the residential point of view so much as it is from the developer point of view, that they're just very nervous about uh, someone like Lauren, who is very, very smart and, and uh, strong-willed and has very... Um, from my point of view, uh, appropriate ideas about the next 30 years of our city or certainly the next uh, pivot of our city in terms of development. And, you know, they're just not used to that. Our our, our long history with development for 30 years, uh, going back to the very beginning, is that, um, you know, we said, please like us. Whatever you want to do, just like us, and we will approve it. And I think that I've been working for the last four years to slow that down and bring that to an end because it isn't sustainable. There's Currently, there's a, about $1.5 billion worth of construction in our 1.9 square mile city with a billion dollars in the pipeline. And that is just not a sustainable model for uh, any kind of uh, capacity building or thinking about how we would want to treat our residents or our businesses or our traffic or our parking, etc. And most importantly, almost, our environment. Uh, we don't really have a very good green building standard. It uh, was designed in the 90s, and it certainly shows. Um, our buildings get, you get points for things that are um, technology of a decade ago. People being there for a long period of time. And being there for a long period of time does create a long series of issues that people now have to deal with. And Lauren, you're a woman. The role of women in politics, uh, seeing as if we go back to one of my favorite stories in history, the Iroquois population, going back to Native Americans, when Ben Franklin and others observed the curious thing, which much of our federal government is wrapped around, and there were one-third of the Iroquois Council were women. The reason was that instead of the male uh, imperative, which is kill it, then find out why it was upset, if you ran it through the women, they would say, well, what's, what's, what do they want to know? What, what are they, what's their issue? And um, I think this may also be an interesting solution, de seeing as we've got developers and a lot of sort of testosterone-driven, aggressive uh, business acumen that has uh, hair and teeth, uh, gnashing hair and teeth, at least that's the opinion of many people who live here. Um, would you offer that maybe stand back and look at it female approach? Well, you know, I don't know if it's really... For me, gender-driven, I mean, uh, four years ago, I voted for John D'Amico because I thought he was the most qualified candidate uh, versus a, a female candidate that was running. Uh, from uh, trenchant thinker, as a matter of fact. I want to welcome you both and appreciate your giving up your time to answer some questions. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, thanks, thanks, Carrie, for having me. Now, let's jump right into it. Lauren, you want to be on city council. There's obviously a great reason why. Yes. Well, you know, we, um, as you said, we've had uh, the same city leaders for a long time. And if you really want change in the city, then you're going to have to change the uh, 
it's the people that are on council. Uh, we have we have different issues happening. We have parking issues. We have traffic issues. We have housing affordability issues, and I I'm running to to help make things better. And better is the operative word because it goes way just beyond parking. And John D'Amico, uh, you've been in the city government. And, you know, of the greater population, what would you say the, the top three points are that you guys endlessly have to deal with? Well, I think in this election uh, and in the past uh, four years since I was elected, the, the, since I was elected, um, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, ethics and transparency and about development and what's actually sustainable for us as a community. And then, as uh, Lauren mentioned, about uh, affordability and uh, who's in and who's out and um, how we protect our current residents and how we invite in uh, new folks who are moving into our newly newly completed uh, buildings. And we have, you know, let's just call them, uh, for lack of exactitude, or for, for actually to honor exactitude, we also have weird controversies. If the LA Times is to be believed, if the uh, LA Weekly is to be believed, these are mainstream media, including local blogs, local newspapers, there is a kind of uh, curious uh, sexual peccadillo going on in the current sitting parts of it anyway, city council uh, people giving sex partners, city jobs, things like that. What would both of you say about uh, what ought to be done for that kind of behavior from your own personal ethics? Let me begin by saying I can't comment on what's happening in the city because there's obviously investigations and uh, it's HR matters. Um, and I just think that's the right thing to say. Um, and so I, I, I really don't want to comment on that, Carrie, but perhaps Lauren has some some ideas or thoughts that might reflect what the community is thinking. Yeah, well, I think I think there's actually the bigger picture, and that city hall is dysfunctional and overly political, and uh, and and that again comes from 